I'm Chris Houck. I'm 33 years old, and I've been bladesmithing for about six years. Family's pretty supportive, but my son, he's a little bit of a smart aleck. He gives me hard times, like, he'll be out in the first round, so now I gotta be sure to try to prove him wrong. <laughs> my name is Larry Rhodes, 44 years old. I live in Bolton, Kansas. I'm kind of a perfectionist, kind of from the old school. If you're gonna do it, do it right, or don't do it at all. Ready to go? Yes, sir, I am. All right. My name is Cordell Whitfield. I'm 20 years old, and I'm from Telephone, Texas. I love bladesmithing because I just like fire and metal. <laughs> Where'd you get that belt? I won it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you did. I'm Dana Ryder. I'm from Ona, West Virginia. I'm 45 years old. I'm a school bus driver and a part-time bladesmith. I'm a competitive person. I'll race you to the end of the street if I have enough energy. <laughs> Play Smiths, welcome to the Forge. I hope the four of you guys came rested and ready because we've got three very intense and uniquely designed rounds of forging competition for you. Now, at the end of each round, you're gonna present your finished work to our panel of expert judges who will then critique your work and make an elimination. Those judges today are ABS Master Smith Jay Nielsen, Historic Weapons Recreation Specialist Dave Baker, and Edge Weapons Specialist and Kali Martial Artist Doug Markaida. Now, gentlemen, these guys behind me are the ones who will decide which one of you is going to leave here with the title of Forged and Fire Champion and $10,000 richer. Now, let's address the elephant in the room. I'm sure you guys have noticed there is a pile of crates in front of me. And that's because inside each of those crates is the steel you guys are going to need to use to make signature blades in your signature style. Oh, crap. There's no telling what could be in these boxes. This is probably not good. When I say go, you will each come up, select a crate, break into it, and find your steel. If you come up, grab a crate, you don't like what's inside, you can decide to use another crate, but that's all you get. You only have one backup, so make that first box count. Now, gentlemen, when you're making your blades, we need you to fall within these parameters. Your blade length needs to be between 14 and 16 inches. And at the end of this round one, you will need to be quenched, hardened, and etched, because we want to see those patterns. Now, in round two of this competition, you will add handles to your blades, turning them into fully functioning weapons, at which point the judges will test for strength and durability in a moose antler chop, and then check your edge retention in a sugarcane slice. We have three hours on the clock, so good luck, work hard, your time starts now. What's, What's in, in the, the box? box? <laughs> what would you guys do? You go for a big box or small box? I'd go for the heaviest box. One thing I don't want to see is a uh, ball bearing. I hate ball bearings. They're just too hard. I just don't like it. First thing I see is about a uh, two and a half inch elevator cable. Cable's great, man. Just weld up those ends, weld a work stick into it, and you're in the forge. Welding. I've done cable before. It's just a little bit bigger than what I normally do. I'm not too worried about it being clean. I think I can burn it out and tighten it up. Does Larry have to clean it on the inside? That's what I always do. Yep. I'll weld the ends and then just tap it on the anvil to open up a little bit so I can get some flux on the inside. I just go up there and grab the first crate I can get a hold of. Inside, I find chain, and it's dirty. All that dirty steel leads to a lot of D-lambs. It can look solid, and then as you're grinding, it just opens up, and there's, there's a flaw. Do I want to do this, or do I not? Kind of my worst nightmare, but I also don't know what's in that other crate. So I feel like I'm better off sticking with what I got. So I got to try to get that clean before I can start my process. Chris has a bike chain that he's throwing into a canister from Canister Damascus. I need to get my whiteout in my can, so the whiteout acts as a barrier between my powdered steel and the chain from actually welding to the can itself. With the size of this knife, I would leave that can on. Oh, absolutely. I'm just trying not to stare at the clock, because I don't want to let the clock get in my head. Boy, what a surprise I got. Two little tiny coil springs. There's no way of making anything out of it, because it's like a quarter inch thick. So we got to cut this dude up and put it in a canister and go for the gusto. Dana's putting his steel in, his coils, no white out. Good. Smart. I've got it all welded up. 
and I'll stick it in the forge and I'll start to get it up to temperature. I'm just hoping when I open this box, I don't find a bunch of fish hooks or something. I really do not want to do a canister. What I find is a bunch of pipe wrenches. I have no idea what I'm going to do with these things. Cordell's got the pipe wrench, which is not bad, but he's got to remember just the jaws themselves is all hardenable. So if he can get that cleaned off, chopped up, put it in a canister, he'll be OK. Right, I think I'll have enough steel with just this top jaw to get where I need to go. Right now, I'm thinking mono steel is my safest bet because it's just a lot safer to go this route. Cordell only put that one L-shaped jaw into the forge. That is not enough steel. I pull my steel out of the forge. I feel it's hot enough. Get in there. And I start to twist. It's not moving like the way I want it to. What Larry's working on right now is fairly hot enough. The starting of cable Damascus, you really have to be aggressive. You want to twist that cable up. I need to heat it up more, drawing it on out, making it a little thinner. If I can get at least one twist on it, I'm just going to run with it. And I'm worried about the clock. Gentlemen, you guys are one hour in. You have two hours until the critique. I feel like my can looks like it's starting to melt, so I start squeezing that billet down slowly. Chris is going slow, taking a little bite here, all the way down. If this thing doesn't weld right now, then I'm in trouble. I'm ready to try to start opening my can and separating it from the billet. Oh, that's not good. But I think I welded the can right to the billet itself. Dang it. Now Chris has to peel that canister open to see use white out. Finally. It's a huge sigh of relief. As long as my welds are solid, I think I have enough time to pull this off. I'm able to go over and start pressing this thing in the shape. My can looks like it's done everything it's supposed to. I'm cutting off uh, the end of the can. Why would he even be cutting the ends off? The only reason I would suggest cutting the ends off is to make sure your core is welded up solid. That <laughs> looks like crap. My billet just kind of looks like <laughs> macaroni and cheese. Should I go ahead with this, or should I not? Finally. I could see that there was enough steel that had welded in there, so I knew that I could work with it. And I stick it back in the forge, and I take it to Big Blue, and I start beating the snot out of this thing. So I got this pipe wrench, so I got to straighten it out and make it look somewhat knife-shaped. He's going to need to add steel to that to get to 16 inches. I look down, measure it, and I'm like two or three inches short. Crap. I don't know if I'm going to make it to that 14-inch mark or not. Cordell's struggling for length. I'm afraid if I restart, I'm going to get something even worse than this pipe wrench, and I just don't want to risk it. I'd rather stick with what I got and see if it can make it work. Cordell is sticking with it. It's worrisome, but what if it works? We have been surprised in the past. Yep. My blade is 14 and an eighth inches long, so I made it just barely. I'm just hopeful by making it this narrow and this thin that it doesn't snap or something during the testing. I feel pretty good with it. It's starting to move out. And I start hogging off steel. I want to see what kind of issues I've got. I had a couple of issues, but I think it was big enough where I can sand them out. I'm pretty happy with it so far. Blade Smith, you guys are halfway through! At this point, I've got a large chunk of steel that I still have to draw out into a bar. So I just feel like I've got to play catch up. I've got D lambs all over the place. Ah! I don't understand what Chris is doing. Oh, because it's crumbling on the ends. That's oh, why. No. This is extremely concerning because this bike chain just didn't weld up like I was hoping it would. But I can have D lambs all over the inside of this billet, and I think I'm out of time to start over. Ah. I'm just racking my brain on how I'm going to fix this with the time that I have left. What to do, what to do, what to do, what to do. 
looks like I have enough solid steel in the middle that I can remove those D-lambs and continue on with what I have. Whoa, 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 whoa. What is he doing? Wait, hold Chris on. Chris is cutting in a couple Chris inches off the end. Chris is cutting more again. At this point, I'm just hoping that the steel is solid enough that I can somehow squeak through this round and make it on to the next one. Oh my god, such a small billet now. Tiny. He might end up with as much steel as Cordell has. Oh boy. Ah. I'll make him like a one inch wide blade. It's gonna be thin and it's gonna be lanky. It's not just creating a knife. It's about creating a knife that can do the test that we're required to do. Because I'm gonna be cutting through sugar cane. If I had to call this blade anything, it's probably closest relative is the uh, like a Persian fighter. I think it's gonna hold up fairly well in testing. I gave it a good belly on it for the chops and whatnot, so we'll see. Bladesmith, you have one hour on the clock. My blade right now looks like a solid piece of metal, so I can get ready for my quench. Dana's in the quench. Oh, good for Dana. He forged it to create the steel yeah. that he is then going to shape on the grinder. That's not necessarily a bad thing to do. I pull it out, and that thing looked like a bow that you could go hunt with. So I go back for another quench. Second quench. See how it goes this time. Whoa, Huge. man. Huge. Huge. Still not good, <laughs> so I know that there's something I've got to do. I end up bringing an oxygen settling torch over and I heat it up just enough and it pops back into shape. It's not perfect, but I'm just hoping that the judges are okay with it. Wow, Larry's blade is looking like a big old badass machete. We're gonna be chopping on uh, antler and uh, some sugar cane, so I think my best bet is go for a camp knife. I'm gonna get ready to do my quench. This is where it's going to tell me. If I have any D lambs, this whole thing could come apart. Bingo! Well, I had a good straight blade for the most part. I'm feeling pretty good about it. So I started hogging off some steel, and I started seeing a little bit of D lambs. And I'm like, you know, just go ahead and fix it. If you're not familiar with the cable, it can be tricky. You can get seams buried down in there that pop up later. I cleaned up my weld, so I think I'm OK on my blade. I need to nail this heat treat. If I don't, I'm just screwed. When they're this thin, they can just warp into high heaven. We're done just quenched. I pull it out. It's mostly straight. I can grind the rest of it out, so I think I'm good now. Down to 20 minutes. No, 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 wrong way. Damn it. I've got just enough steel here to make a blade that's 14 to 16 inches, but I do not have much left to make a handle out of, so I'm screwed. It's just going to have to be a hidden tang knife. I have no other choice. I don't want to go with a hidden tang knife just because that's kind of a critical point, so you want as much mass there as possible. I finally get in my tang where I wanted to, so I got to get it in oil. And boom. All right, all four blades have been quenched. I pulled it out of the quench, and I had a straight blade. Hey, something actually went right. <laughs> in my last few minutes, I know I've got to try to grind these bevels as well as possible. And if I make it on in round two, I can maybe grind away some of the D-lambs towards the cutting edge. I'm at the grinder shaping the blade how I want, and I see the laminations, uh, the flat part of the blade. I don't want to go home because there's cracks, so I try to get those taken off best I can. Five, four, three, two, one. Gentlemen, turn off your machines, put down your tools, Round one of this competition is over. It's done everything it could possibly do to kick my rear end, and I've, I feel like I've already won just by not giving up. Well, gentlemen, you all delivered within parameters, so congratulations. But the time has come for critique, which means three of you are going forward in this competition. One of you is heading home. Chris, please present your work. All right, Chris, for the most part, nice work. 
Most of your steel looks pretty solid. You do have some seams from the bike chain. The biggest issues I have right now is you got big creases right in here that actually travel down. That's something that could structurally fail. But you've got a lot of meat still on here to work with. So good start. Thank you. Larry, you ready? Yes, I am. Please present your work. Well, Larry, you've got by far the most knife up here. That's a heck of a blade. And for the most part, your cable weld came together quite nicely. There's two wicked stress risers right there. I would suggest that you don't leave those at sharp corners. But uh, all together, nicely done, man. Thank you, sir. Cordell, let's see what you came up with. All right, Cordell, I believe this is one of the lightest blades ever submitted. You, sir, can move metal. But in a competition like this, one of the things we're concerned about is design a blade for the test. Is this blade heavy enough to cut through sugar canes? Something to think about should you move forward. All right, Dana, let's see what you came up with. All right, Dana, so right off for a chopper, great profile, handle works in my hand. That big swell back here on a chopper is a nice thing to have. Still got a significant warp to that blade. The problem is, is that I can see delaminations following a lot of these springs uh, up here at the tip. Another one down here right at the tang connection. So if you move forward, you got some stuff to work on, though. Placements, we did not give you an easy task today. But this is a competition, and only three of you can move forward into the second round. The bladesmith leaving the forge is Dana. Unfortunately, you're not going to be moving forward in this competition, and Doug's going to tell you why. Dana, we commend you for turning in a blade. That wasn't an easy challenge. But we feel that your blade has the most issues to fix, a pronounced warp, a delamination, and there's not a lot of metal there to fix it. So it's for these reasons we're sending you home. Understand. Dana, you fought hard, you didn't give up, and you turned in a blade within parameters, so you have a lot to be proud of. But unfortunately, your time in this competition has ended. I'm going to have to ask you to please surrender your work and step off the forge floor. Thanks for working so hard. I got sent home, but I'm not down on myself at all. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. It was well worth the trip for the experience and everything. I'm going to go back to my home and I'm going to get in my nice, warm, cozy bed. <laughs> and I'm going to enjoy it. Gentlemen, congratulations. That means the three of you are moving forward into the second round of this fierce competition. In this round, you guys are going to fix any issues you have with your blades, as well as add handles to them, turning them into fully functioning weapons. Now, we don't like to waste anything here in the forge, so for your handle materials, you'll have to come back to the pile of crates and source your scales. The crates are mostly made out of plywood and some other lumber that's just not great handle material, so I'm not looking forward to it. At the end of this round, the judges will test your blades for strength and durability in a moose antler chop. Then we're going to check the edge retention in a sugar cane slice. Good luck. Your time starts now. So a lot of the crates are made from particle board or plywood, but there are some good, decent pieces of hardwood in there. First thing I'm going to do in round two is go and get my handle material. Plywood could split or crack, so I got to find a good solid piece and try to use that. Now, Cordell's going to be interesting. I don't think it's going to be heavy enough to cut through sugar canes. Yeah, I don't know about that. This blade isn't specifically designed for the test they have, but there is nothing I can think of to make it better. This is what I went with, so this is what I'm stuck with. So first thing I'm going to do is address this blade and try to take care of the issues that the judges addressed. As I'm grinding, I do see that I have a bad delamination towards the Ricasso area. Mm. There is a lot of stress in that point. Everything travels up towards the handle. Chris also has to be careful because it's already quite a light blade. So the more he grinds to fix some of the delaminations, the lighter that blade's going to get. I'm able to address enough of my D-lambs to feel OK with moving on to the handle. Hopefully not much of this bad spot comes into contact with the antler. 
The first thing is I want to address some issues that Dave talked about. The way he's got those shoulders cut, that's a huge stress riser. And we've seen swords snap off right at the guard, right at those shoulders. So I'm going to round these edges up, make everything smooth. It's looking a little bit better. I got it rounded out a little bit. Now it's just concentrating on the rest of my handle. So now I get ready to shape the handles. Knowing what they're going to do with this blade, I'm going to try to make it more on the beefy side. That way, they have plenty to grab a hold of. He's got a pretty thin profile on his handle. He's going to end up with a blade that wants to be held sideways. I got steak knives with bigger handles than that. Halfway through, guys. You have one hour left. Let's see here. I've got a hidden tang knife, but I don't want to have to take the time to fiddle with this guard, so I decided to try to do a somewhat frame construction. I was wanting some micarta or G10. Instead of what I'm working with is this plywood scrap stuff that they made the box from. Oh, this is junk. I don't know if Chris even grabbed any of the good wood. So I cut out my frame. I go to fit my tang in it, and it just pops apart. Ah, damn it. Start another one. That was no good. Maybe third time's a charm, I guess. And I don't have time for this. Knowing that the clock's ticking in the back of my head, I'm getting nervous. I'm going to cut shorter than my marks and then just slowly grind away the excess. All right. I guess for plywood goes, it's about as good as you could hope for. Whether or not it'll stay together is yet to be determined. Now that I got my wood all marked out, cut up, I need to run over to the pantry and want to see what options I had. Beans that I had pieces on both sides, and my best bet was to go with a Corby. It's a lot tighter, mechanical fit. I'm putting it all together, and then I start having a problem. Uh oh, Larry's looking at the Corbys. Yeah, it looks like it. They're not lining up together. You son of a bitch. The threads are a fine thread, and if you don't have everything perfectly lined up, then it's hard to get them starting. If I don't get it in there, my epoxy is going to dry on me. Finally, I ended up getting it. <sighs> Now I'm relieved. I know the only thing I have to deal with now is the blade. Wait, Smith, you're down to 30 minutes. So I get done with my handle. All I got to do is sharpen this thing. Cordell's blade, I like a lot, actually. I think it's a beautiful design, but it's not it's designed not for, for the test. test. Exactly. I'm just afraid it's going to snap in that strength test. And so I did make my edge a bit thicker. That way, it could withstand a little bit more abuse. Even if I go home, I feel like I made a blade up to my standards, and I'm happy with that. My next hurdle I got to jump over is the edge. So I'm going to hit it with my polishing wheel. What people can do with an angle grinder is really amazing sometimes. I'm done with my edge. I'm happy with it. Done deal. Chris didn't just do like a frame. He actually got pins all the way around the wood. As he should. This is not ideal, but it's what I got. Mm. Right now, I have to shape down this huge block of wood. Blade Smith, you have 10 minutes. Well, I have to be careful to not go too deep on it and grind some of these pins away. It's not exactly the shape that I'm looking for, but I still have to get the knife sharpened with the time that I have left. Five, four, three, two, one. Gentlemen, put down your tools. This round is over. At the end of this round, I don't love this handle. I freaking hate it. But at this point, it's in the judge's hands. All right, gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for the strength test, the moose antler chop. Now, to test the strength and overall construction of your blades, I'm going to take your blades and gently tap them against these moose antlers. <laughs> you ready for this, Chris? I guess so. <laughs> Lovingly tap. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know inside this blade, there's potential voids and delams. A solid strike like that could just cause that to let go and snap the blade right in half. All right, Chris, so right off, as I was using this, the handle started losing some parts. So one of your pins you kind of ground through and exposed. 
And then there's another pin right here that on the back that's kind of starting to drift out. But handle's still together. Your edge is still sharp, except for right here where there's a thin flake of metal that's actually popped off of that section. But it's a brutal test. Your knife's still sharp, still a viable knife. Nice and done. Thanks. All right, Larry, you're up. You ready? No, Dave, I'm not. <laughs> After watching the first guy, I'm petrified. I know he's going to hit it hard. Whatever happens, happens. See how it goes. So, Larry, you got a beast of a blade here. It's got a huge profile. I really like it, actually. As far as your blade goes in the test, you lost some edge through a section right here. Nothing's missing. It's just no longer as sharp as the rest of the blade is. Your handle construction is pretty bulky, but as far as the strength test goes, the blade held up quite well. Good job. Thank you, sir. All right, Cordell, you ready? No. No. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> The moose antler chop is definitely not an easy test. My blade is so small, I'm afraid something is going to go catastrophically wrong with it. <laughs> All right, Cordell. <laughs> if this knife were this long, that handle would be fine. <laughs> Hanging on to that handle while you're swinging like that. It's just hard to do. It's a small handle. Your edge is more of an ax edge, but it held up fine. All in all, it's an odd design for this test, but I got to say that you executed it beautifully. So nicely done. Mm -hmm. All right, Bladesmiths, welcome to the sharpness test, the sugar cane slice. Now, unlike the strength test, this is all about how sharp your blades are and how well they can cut through these sugar canes. Chris, you're up first. You ready for this? I guess so. All right, let's get some sugar. All right, Chris, first up your handle construction. The sections where you lost some pins can be a hot spot. Now your edge. So as soon as it hit the spot where your delamination is, it stopped cutting. But it did cut three pieces, and overall, sir, you will cut. Thank you. All right, Larry, your turn. So you ready? Yes, sir, I am. Let's do it. All right, Larry, let's talk about your blade. It starts off sharp right here, and then right here, it starts to lose its edge. So it's sharp enough to cut through four sugar canes, and overall, sir, it will cut. Good. All right, Cordell, come on. Let's get some sugar cane sugar high. <laughs> I don't have a lot of mass behind my blade, so it has to be sharp if it's going to even try to make a cut through all the sugar cane. I'm just sitting here sweating bullets. I am terrified right now. All right, Cadell, let's talk about your weapon here. Your edges are sharp, but there's just not enough mass to help push it through. But when we look at it, it actually cut three pieces. But overall, sir, for the little knife that says it could, it will cut. Thank you. All right, Blade Smiths, well, we gave you guys a difficult challenge, but only two of you can move forward in this competition, which means one of you is going to be heading home. And today, the Blade Smith leaving the forge is Chris, unfortunately, your blade didn't make the cut. Dave Baker's going to tell you why. Chris, I think you did a great job designing a, a weapon for these tests. But that failure of the weld and the blade, as well as parts of the handle starting to come off, well, those are the two reasons we're letting you go for. Absolutely. I appreciate the chance. Thanks. Well, Chris, you fought hard. You have what it takes to be in this forge. But unfortunately, you're not going to be moving forward in this competition, man. I'm going to have to ask you to please step off the forge floor. See you. The problems that I had in this blade, the handle starting to pull apart, I knew I was done. With the issues that blade had, I actually thought it was going to explode on the first strike. <laughs> Whenever I get home, I'm going to rub it in my son's face. 
Hey, Damien, I might not be the Forge of Fire champion, but at least I didn't go out in the first round like you thought I would. Gentlemen, congratulations. You are both moving forward into the third and final round of this competition. Now, in this last round, we're going to ask you to go back to your home forges and build an iconic weapon from history that has been shrouded in mystery. Gentlemen, we want you to build this. The Medieval Sword of Mystery. The Medieval Sword of Mystery has been puzzling historians for centuries. This double-edged broadsword features a double fuller, making it light enough to wield single-handed, delivering fast, lethal strikes. The sword was found in the River Witham in East England in 1825. It's believed to have been forged back in the 13th century, although its exact origin is a mystery. Even more mysterious, the blade has a gold inlaid inscription etched into the steel in an unknown language. Several years ago, the British Museum recruited the public to help decipher it. But to this day, no one has been able to crack the code. Gentlemen, when you're building your swords, you need to fall within these parameters. Your blade length, measured from tip to guard, needs to be between 28 and 30 inches. You need to have two fullers on both sides of the blade. Your handle must include a cruciform guard and a disc-shaped pommel. What makes this blade such a mystery is the inscription, which you will also need to include in your blades. I've never made anything this big. It's going to be a challenge. There ain't no doubt about that. Bladesmiths, you will have four days to build your medieval swords of mystery. So good luck. We'll see you guys in four days. Good luck, buddy. I'm back at my home forge here in Fulton, Kansas. I'm going to attempt to make a 100-layer twist Damascus mystery sword. I should have way more still than what I need, but I make a lot of mistakes. I think what I need to do to win is I need to hit the wow factor. That's ready to go in a forge. I'm going to run two billets at the same time, so I'm not waiting on it. All right, here we go. Yeah, I'm worried about my time frame. Because, you know, anything can happen. I can get an inclusion in my blade, and that's all it takes. Billet number two. Got good welds on it, and we think it'll be OK. Woo! I'm done. <laughs> back in Telephone, Texas. Now for the spicy bit. Game plan for the day is getting all the forging and get the heat treat out of the way. Every single second is definitely going to be critical. I'm going to need all the time I can get. I've never heat treated anything this long before, so I'm just going to heat treat it without grinding it. That way, it gives me a lot less chance of warping, but it's going to be a lot more time at the grinder. Now for the spicy bit. As I'm going to quench, I really hope I don't pull it out and turn into a banana. It's hard. Now it's the grind marathon. Day two, a lot of work to do today. I'm going to grab the two billets, put a right hand twist in one, a left hand twist in the other, cut them up, and restack them. All right, here we go. Well, it looks like I have a piece with a crack in it. Starts here, goes down, over, and back up. So I'm going to scrap this project. I don't want to take any chances with it. I'm going to go ahead and go to plan B. I got a bar 5160, so I'm just going to go ahead and put it in the forge and run it on out. Looking forward for the wow factor. It's not going to happen. I'm already into day two, so I just don't want to have time kind of bite me in the ass. Got her close for the quench. All right, here we go. Perfect. Right now, we're back on track. Yeah, it's good and straight blade. Yesterday, I got the blade mostly finished ground. The sword's brighter than my future. Today, I definitely have to finish the handles. Otherwise, I won't have enough time for glue to set properly. So I'm going to try to do a routine with this green wood I have and see how that goes. I have had wood break before, so I'm really hoping it doesn't happen again, because that could possibly set me back. Well, it broke. I got to come up with something else. I don't know if I got any more wood. I don't think there's any salvage in this. Time kind of matters right now. I really want to get the handle on today, so I got to come up with something else. No, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a leather stack. With a leather stack, all I got to do is stack it up, glue it together, and put the pommel on. It'll be a lot easier that way, so on to leather. Day four, last day. I'm ready to go. I'm going to concentrate on the handle. It's starting to look like a guard hand. 
First up, I think I'm gonna weld a bolt on it for a threaded pommel. Well, I don't think it looks very good, but too bad. Put my handle together. I wanna make sure it's a good tight fit. Don't want anything loose. Ooh. I wish I had more time on the detail work, but let's go in there and test it and get her done and get it over with. I'm ready. Final day at the Home Forge. Today, I just got to finish shaping the handle. I got to sharpen it, and then that's it. For this part of the program, we will now start the mystery inscription. A medieval mystery sword got a mysterious inscription that nobody can figure out. Pretty good. I'm going to scratch off the letters, and then I'll etch that, and that'll just etch the letters, and it will leave my blade shiny. I believe that's going to work. I like how it turned out. Oh, yeah. This is a pretty sharp blade. Let's go chop up some water bottles. There you go. There you go. I'm definitely proud of the sword. I can't wait to see it tested and hopefully come away with that 10 grand in the championship. That's super satisfying. And bragging rights. Love to have bragging rights. Never had those before. Well, gentlemen, welcome back to the forge. It's good to see you. Guys, we sent you back to your home forges for four days to work on the medieval sword of mystery. Now, only one of these swords is going to win a $10,000 check and the title of Forge of Fire champion. But before we get into that, I want to hear about it. Cordell, how'd it go for you? Build went pretty good. I used 5160 steel, brass guard, and pommel, and I went with a leather stack handle. Well, it's great. Larry, how about you? Had a couple of bumps in the road. Went to a 5160. Got a good edge on it pushing the clock towards the end, but hope it holds up. Well, guys, your blades look deadly, but there's only one way to find out if they are as functional as they look. We've got a strength test, a sharpness test, and up first, the kill. Doug? Bladesmiths, welcome to the kill test. The legendary medieval sword of mystery. Well, the first mystery we're going to solve right now is, are they lethal? Cordelia, you're first. You ready for this? I suppose. All right, let's do this. I've never built anything this big and uh, nervous. The blade, I feel, is solid, but I have no idea. Let's just get it over with. All right, Cordero, let's talk about your medieval sword of mystery. First up, your handle construction. Your handle is nice and smooth. The one issue I have is it has all this space. Now, let's talk about your edge. These boards are no joke. They're very tough to cut through. But your edge made easy cuts and thrust on this boar carcass. And I finally figured out what that word right there says. It will kill. Larry, your turn, sir. You ready? Yes, sir. Let's do this. My main concern coming into this test is my cutting edge. My heat treat came out good, but anything can go wrong. Guys, I think we have a parameter issue here that we need to talk about. Quick cuddle. Well, Larry, it seems that Doug saw something with your blade that he wants to discuss further with the judges. So, gentlemen, while they talk, I'm going to ask you to please step off the fourth floor. All right, the guys are out. What'd you see? Well, what I did not see on Larry's sword is a disc pummel. We asked him to replicate an iconic, legendary medieval sword of mystery. That's not a style of a blade, that's one particular blade. When you look at that, it's got one form, one look. We put these parameters down because we want everything to test evenly. It's not the sword we asked for. You know, a disc pommel is not a vague idea. You want a disc pommel for counterbalance on the blade. 
Also, you want that swell where it is much larger than the handle itself for retention. With what we have on Larry's, it actually tapers smaller than the handle. So there's a good chance of swinging it, have it fly out of your hand and endanger people around you. Well, you guys on the same page? Yeah. All right, we'll call them back in. All right, Larry, we got a bit of an issue. We asked you guys to recreate the medieval sword of mystery. Now, part of that sword is the disc-shaped pommel. The judges have talked it through, and they've decided that your pommel does not fit within the definition of a disc-shaped pommel. So unfortunately, it is a parameter failure. Larry, one of the parameters for the sword of mystery was a disc pommel. Two biggest reasons for that, aside from the fact it was part of the original design, is having that mass back there to retain the sword while it's being swung. Also, the weight to counterbalance the blade. Your pommel doesn't have that. And we're worried that swinging that, it could go flying across the room. Well, Larry, you fought hard through this, but unfortunately, with the parameter failure and the fact that the judges can't test your blade fairly against Cordell's, I'm going to have to ask you to please step off the forge floor. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you, Good Larry. fight. Yeah, I'm disappointed with it. I wanted him to see it perform. I was running up against the clock, running close, so uh, I worked up the last minute getting it done. But I forgot my disc pommel. That's how it goes. But uh, I had a good time. Well, Cordell, your hard work paid off. You are the newest Forge and Fire champion, and you just won yourself a check for $10,000. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm pretty excited. I hate to win it this way, but I'm excited to win it nonetheless. You won, fair and square. Well done. Good job, Cordell. Good job. I doubt I'll make another sword, but I was very happy with my blade, and I had a lot of fun.